He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eye. All right. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Martin Willis, your host. And we have an interesting show for you today. This is a special show and it's with the sons of J. Allen Hynek, two of them. We have Paul and we have Joel. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, the legacy of of uh, uh, J. Allen Hynek and all kinds of things. I have a number of questions that were sent in. After the first half hour, we are going to accept calls, and I'll put that number up on the screen. It's a new number and a new system, and I uh, have tested it out many times. We should be <coughs> just fine with it. So we're going to go and uh, try that um, in, like I said, in uh, after the first hour of the show. And so I would like to welcome my guests both um, Paul and Joel Hynek, welcome, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to, be, to be here. Yes, uh, um, we had a couple of technical difficulties, but we got through it. Um, let's let's hope everything uh, goes smoothly from here on. And uh, first of all, uh, we already have some people trying to call in here, um, but I would like for, to wait till the second half of the show, if possible, or the second uh, uh, and the half hour here. <coughs> Um, before we get started, I, I just want to tell you um, I had a, a note from someone that you're going to like this, I do believe. And uh, when I was living out in California, I got to meet Tom Snyder and uh, talk show host. And I actually I'm a fine arts appraiser. That's what I do for re real work. And um, I ended up doing uh, appraising Tom's estate after he passed away. And so I, I remain in touch with uh, Pamela Burke. And I happen to notice um, your dad on the Tom Snyder show, lots of interviews. So I wrote her, she wrote me back this morning and she said, uh, J. Allen Hynek was a favorite guest and one the audience really enjoyed. And that's from Pamela Burke. Uh, she was a producer of the show and she told me she Ooh. loved his sense of humor. And, uh, she said that, uh, people just couldn't wait for him to come on the show. And, uh, anyway, I thought you might like to hear that. Good to hear. Yeah. Thank you. So just uh, what was it like uh, growing up in, uh, in the household when uh, your dad was looking at the UFO topic? Uh, well, I guess uh, I'm the oldest, so maybe I'll go first on that one. Um, it was pretty interesting. Uh, there um, were always a lot of uh, interesting phone calls and people coming over to our house. <laughs> My father's, uh, you know, our, our phone was in the phone phone number was in the phone book, so, uh, and he welcomed people to call. Um, and he was, uh, well, he was a bit of a, um, uh, he, he was a ham radio operator, and I got the, the bug from him and set up sort of an electronics uh, lab in my basement, and uh, which is also my room. And so often when he would have a, um, was going to do an interview with somebody over the phone, he would say, hey, Joel, would you, uh, please record that because he knew I had tapped the family phone line and uh, had a, you know, a reel to reel tape recorder going down in the basement. Wow. So, uh, so I would sit there in my room listening to these uh, interviews and it was, uh, it was pretty interesting. Um, the thing that struck me uh, about it the most, I think was how similar so many of the uh, reports were. Um, so many car stoppage cases that were, you know, very similar in the way they played out, and some very strange um, incidents. One in particular, a woman in a trailer park in Tennessee, I think, who was describing, similar to a car stoppage, a big light coming by, and she found herself levitating off off the bed. That left an impression on me. But growing up with mom and dad and the family, everybody was, uh, it was interesting. They're rarely a dull moment. My father always had interesting stories to tell. And, uh, and, and it was the people who came through the house that were uh, fascinating. My mother was uh, quite a sociable person. And so she would welcome people into the house and very often invite them for dinner and um, they would tell these interesting stories that, um, you know, was, I guess, not your average um, 
uh, type of uh, environment. And uh, so, Paul, um, is there any particular time, like at school or anything like that, that you were, did you ever have, uh, we're having a little trouble with your camera here, you look very colorful right now. Um, did you ever have any ridicule or did, did uh, kids think it was interesting when you talked about it and could you talk about it? Uh, well, they couldn't stop us from talking about it. Um, <laughs> yeah, there was no ridicule. Um, you know, my dad was somebody, especially when Close Encounters came out when I was in my teens, my dad became more well known a little bit outside the circle of sort of UFO um, and astronomy and astrophysics crowd. Um, but, you know, he was, I, I never ridiculed or teased about it. People thought, it was, all my friends thought it was really super cool. Uh, it was really fun. And, and as Joel said, my dad was a very personal guy with a great sense of humor. So he would come downstairs when we we're having parties in the basement and talk to our friends and they'd say, oh, Dr. Heineck is here. And they'd ask him about some UFO case or something that they'd heard about. So it was, it was a lot of fun. And we were, we were very proud of him for being a scientist and, and being open-minded enough to tackle this great big question. Um, and as Joel said, we had you know, a coterie of fascinating people come by. Um, we had Father Gill over for dinner uh, oh. of the famous case in Papua oh, yeah. New Guinea. And you know, he was attending an ecumenical conference in the U.S. He wasn't on a book tour for UFOs or anything. But, you know, my father heard about it and invited him over for dinner. And, well, if you have a famous UFO sighting and you come to the Heineck house for dinner, you're going to have to talk about it. That's just the deal. So it was, it was fascinating. You know, it was, it was a normal household in many aspects. But we had UFO ornaments on the trees and paintings of Travis Walton on the wall and things like that. So it was, it was a great environment, both from a scientific point of view and sort of UFOs adding a nice accent to it. Wow! Yeah, that's really that's really amazing. So, uh, Joel, you are the um, you are older, um, and I believe you're the one who's portrayed in the uh, History uh, Channel series, right? As the the boy, and <coughs> at least yes. that's what it says in casting. That's me, yeah. supposedly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, although the time is not, I'm a little older than I should have been at the time that the uh, series is is uh, going on right now. Um, so I'm sort of a conglomerate, really, of all the Heineck sons. Uh-huh, uh-huh. All the Heineck children. What's that? All the Heineck children, because we have a sister as well. Ah, uh, yes. Uh-huh, yes. yeah. Um, I was wondering if there would be more uh, changes as the show progressed. Um, I was able to watch the screeners up to um, episode six. And um, so now I will tell you, and I'm sure you know this, um, well, first of all, I, I read up, uh, uh, Paul, um, I should say that I read um, the letter you sent to Kevin Randall, which he, uh, he showed me and then he posted on his blog, which is great. Um, and, um, and then, you know, there's a lot of grumblings in the UFO field. There, there is often. And one of them, uh, someone commented uh, on what you said about authentic, about Adrian playing authentic. And, um, and so there, there, there's some snide remarks and I just put um, that I believe that Paul meant um, he is playing an authentic character. Is that, that's what you meant more or less by that, right? Authentic to your father and not necessarily what happened? Yes, it's, it's the difference between authentic and accurate. Um, and I have great respect both for Aiden and Laura, who play our TV dad and mom, um, for, may, for having made a lot of efforts to understand really what they were about. Um, talking with Joel and I and doing their own research and coming up with their own sort of take on what this character would have done in these highly exaggerated scenarios. I see. And, uh, and uh, as far as the, the grumblings, I'll, I'll let you take this, um, Joel. I'm sure you have uh, <laughs> looked out there and saw, you know, a lot of people in the UFO community are purists and they're, you know, people are saying, hey, it's, you know, it's muddying the waters, it's, it's doing this, making, you know, people are getting the wrong impression, but not, um, it's, it's as if they don't remember that it's a historical fiction. And uh, I think the, the History Channel is doing a great service by actually providing information on the real cases. That's something that is unprecedented as far as I know. 
Um, so what do you think overall? Does it does it bother you that some of it goes a little overboard? Not really, uh, no, because the the um, intent and the portrayal um, of my father, as Paul said, is uh, authentic. Um, they they have to take some license, um, you know, to make it interesting. When Paul and I first approached them, our you know when we heard about the series was going to happen, and we you know, approached them and said, "Hey, we you know we'd like to help." Our, our main concern was that our father and mother be portrayed in a good light that it, that it you know would would not do harm to my father's uh, reputation or legacy and and they said great why don't you guys be content consultants so that's how we you know sort of got involved in it and we were always um, giving them as much information as we could about you know what my father and mother were really like and what my dad was up to and um, you know, Aiden and, and uh, Laura really tried hard uh, to follow the the details. Aiden would call up and say, "Hey, hey, Joel, you know, how would your father pronounce Haley's Comet? Would it be Halley's or would it be Haley's?" Well, what was and, it? <laughs> you know, uh, well, in Chicago, it was ha it was Haley's, uh -huh. um, but you know, out here in California, it's, it's Halley's. So, um, or maybe it's just now, and that was then, but. Um, you know, it really doesn't bother me. The, it, my mother's character uh, right now, she, uh, Laura is portraying him, her as uh, more demure and less capable than my mother was. So that kind of uh, has been bothering the family a bit. But uh, I think to, her, to that point, Joel, you know, they they've left room for her character to to evolve yes, over time. Yes, yes, she she does she does change. Uh, you know, so we, of course we read we read all the scripts. And uh, shows that she does sort of grow into it, which is not actually uh, inaccurate because my mother did start out as a very young, uh, you know, homemaker and ended up being, you know, quite an aide to my father uh, in the UFO field uh, later on. Yeah, that's that's something I did not know that uh, that she did. Um, I didn't know she had an involvement. Now, I remember reading that your father, you know, back I know he's, he was a. Uh, I think he had some role in the uh, Robertson panel in 1953, and uh, I remember reading that he used to enjoy being a debunker. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. this is, of course, uh, before the transition. I, I'd like to talk about that a little bit, too, in a bit. Um, yeah. I mean, when I was growing up, the first thing I was always hearing was, oh, it's just, uh, you know, normal things being seen under unusual conditions. And then that, of course, changed when he realized that it was, you know, the same thing be, or very often similar things being seen over and over again and by, you know, credible people and multiple witnesses. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the one I know, um, we have a, a friend of the show who's been a lot, uh, Ray Stanford, and I know uh, Ray knew, uh, knew your dad. And and by the way, I do believe we may have a call coming in from someone else that uh, you probably know who it is. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, the Socorro case. Ray was very involved in the Socorro case. Uh -huh. And uh, from what I understand, that was kind of a turning point for your for your dad. Is that? Do you think that's accurate, or do you know what the turning points were? I, I think I, that I, I think that's fair. Um, my my dad did cite that case as one that he found particularly convincing, um, and that was around the time when he felt he had really gotten his sea legs in working with Blue Book. It was crystal clear that his motivation and the Air Forces were different, and, and rightly so. They were not looking to find the scientific truth, certainly not of Project Blue Book and Wright Pat after the 4602nd Air Squadron in 1953 kind of siphoned off all the, the real top secret cases. And by that point, my father really had dug his teeth into this intractable phenomenon and, and getting and sort of shed the cloak of the happy debunker. And I think it was around that time, and that was one of the straws that sort of broke the debunker's back. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, we have a, a, another friend of the show, and he's a very good um, uh, UFO researcher, Dave Marler, David Marler. Are you, I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Um, he has... Uh, He's rather notable for uh, triangle UFOs, but there's a lot more to him than just that. Um, he's also preserving a wonderful archive 
of uh, UFO material, including a lot of Project Blue Book files and things like that. He's out in New Mexico. And so he, he um, said it was okay uh, to use his name to ask a couple of questions, one of them being, what are um, both of your personal opinions? Um, either one of you can go first in, with regard to the UFO, to the UFO subject in general, fact, fit, fiction, et cetera. Well, I definitely think there's something going on there. What it is, uh, who knows, but I think there's just too much evidence, too many reports by credible people, multiple witnesses, that something intelligently guided is, is happening. But what it is, uh, we have yet to find out. I see. Yeah, I was in... Yeah. Um, I was in a lead vehicle for the March for Science a couple of years ago in L.A., and I had a great view of all the signs that people had. Um, these were a bunch of angry nerds. And one of the signs that I really liked had the saying, I'd rather have questions I can't answer than answers I can't question. And I think that sums up what my father felt, and I think probably what Joel and, and certainly what I do, is that this is a phenomenon that has enough evidence for an honest observer to come to the conclusion that there's something there. Now, the provenance, where these things come from, are they extraterrestrial, that's a bit beyond the purview of a real scientist. Um, anybody can have an opinion on that. And frankly, my father thought that the extraterrestrial hypothesis had some problems. You know, you have to travel vast distances, kind of have to tweak Einstein in the nose. We have very sensitive instruments to detect objects coming and leaving our atmosphere, and we don't have the correlating reports to those. And these objects seem to exhibit a lot of comfort with our gravity and our atmosphere. So that's there are some non-trivial problems to that hypothesis. So I also I believe in the singularity and the sort of the Ray Kurzweil benevolent view of the singularity. And if these other civilizations have achieved the ability to come here, they're probably post singularity or you know, AI has become self-aware and recursively self-improving, so they don't really have any need to come here. They don't need our gold. They don't need our water. They're not afraid of us being on the cusp of nuclear prowess, and they're not interested in our exceptional human love. So the issue I have is why would they come here and flit around like Cheshire cats and then leave? And it's just a question I can't answer. I've had... Uh, let me add one. Let me yeah. add one, one. Go ahead. One, sure. Sorry. One, one, one thing to that is, I mean, in, in terms of what do I really think, I really think that they represent something coming from another dimension um, that, because of the way they so often act, part of the time exhibiting earthly physics and then part of the time exhibiting non-earthly physics, like for a while they have mass and then they appear not to. And this also would sort of answer as Paul pointed out, uh, the, the issue of hardware traveling huge distances requiring almost infinite energy, um, that this is some aspect of physics we have yet to discover. Right. That's, yes. That's, that's what I've thought, I've thought as, as well, and, and the possibility. You know, I've mentioned a number of times along the lines of what you said, uh, Paul, um, that why would, if there's so much life out there, possible life out there, I should say, intelligent life, um, possible out there why are we so special why would we be visited by so many you know it, it is pretty curious if you really think about um the topic um like i do almost all the time <laughs> but uh um all right we've had some people try to call in so i will tell you um please be patient we'll be taking your calls in a little <coughs> while um and so if um and i understand what you you just said joel um about you know, the physics thing, there's a lot to get around. I understand your father's um, thoughts also, because I, you know, the scope of uh, travel is unbelievable between one star and another. It's just incomprehensible. Um, so I, I get that and the amount of energy needed, but there may be something else that they know that we don't know as far as, you know, the wormhole thing. There's all kinds of um, mm -hmm. ideas, but um, the interdimensional is another definite possibility. Um, so I, I just, I, I got a, a text from a, a friend of the show who's going to be calling in. Um, and he, he made a really good point. A lot of people listening to the show may not know 
the things that we know because we've been around this. And for once, uh, one of them is the Robertson panel. Um, so that was set up in 1953. And it was basically um, the role of the group was to find ways to um, soften the uh, public outcry about UFOs and try to figure out ways to debunk them. And, of course, your father is known for the uh, swamp gas thing. That probably never lived that one down, right? Ouch. <laughs> and uh, um, so do you know, uh, did he ever talk about the Robinson panel? Um, not much. No, I think that was happened so early on. Um, he, he didn't talk about that much to me anyway. Paul? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I remember hearing him talk about it during an address one time and, and seeing what he wrote about it. I know it was a, a very frustrating time because that's, you know, the Robertson panel and the Condon committee are the sort of two bookends on the Air Force's trial balloons, if you will, for having some public excuse to exit stage right from the UFO phenomena. Right. And what did your, what did your, your, the most controversial and most talked about um, you know, UFO, um, you know, crash or whatever topic always comes back to Roswell. What did your, do you remember what your dad thought about the Roswell case? Uh, he, I mean, he didn't see any reason why it would be, um, you know, or I never saw any evidence for why it was an extraterrestrial uh, visitor. It, it sort of remained, you know, an unidentified flying object to him. No explanation, really, that he could that I that he ever expressed to me beyond that. Well, and, and one of the aspects of the Roswell case that that you know it's hard to explain away is that you have the press information officer of the Air Force Base who puts out a press release saying we have a flying saucer. Right. And you have to think that that person didn't just Johnny off on his own and do this, and his career, in fact, was not impeded afterwards. So he must have had the authority of someone at the base to do that. Now, of course, the next day they retract that. But the fact is, at Roswell, somebody with the authority to make the most infamous press release they're ever going to do said we have a UFO. So, and you'd think there would be some hard-boiled you know, analyst that could determine the difference between balsa wood and tinfoil and some space alloys. So that's just one of the aspects of the Roswell case that won't go away. I agree. And... Uh... That, that something I've brought up on the show many times is they didn't have to say anything. No. There, there wasn't one single reason that they had to say um, anything at all. <laughs> it would have just gone away. So yeah, You I almost get the feeling that they would have tweeted about it if they could have. Yeah. 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 Doesn't make any sense. What about, um, what about taking his, his work home with him? Did he, did he do that in any type of way? Oh yeah, I mean he's he was always you know taking files, um, copying files from the you know, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and of course he had his own filing system of uh, you know reports that he would investigate uh, on his own. And yes, the um, Heineck House became quite a um, library of um, UFO sighting reports. And I think Paul's room there at one point was the uh, official a UFO <laughs> repository at one point. Yeah. Now, was he was he ever stressed by the job? Did he have? Did you ever notice any stress from him? Yes, sure. He was sort of um, in an awkward position because, on the one hand, I mean, he he believed that this was something that we should you know really be studied and should be known to everybody. Uh, so we have people like the McDonald who was beating on him to say, Heineck, you've got to come clean with this. You've got to tell everybody, you know, what's going on. And yet he had also, you know, because he was working at Northwestern and, and other universities, you know, they didn't believe in the whole UFO, UFO thing at all. And so he had to maintain, you know, his scientific credentials. And so he walked uh, a fine line there really, you know, on the, on the fence uh, trying to keep both sides happy, and at the same time, he didn't want to lose, you know, he had to keep the Air Force happy, too. He didn't want to lose his uh, access to all this information, all this data that, you know, as a scientist, he needed to try and figure out what's going on. 
And uh, if I could riff on Joel's point and go back to something you raised, Marty. Sure. Yes. Um, at, at Blue Book, my father had sort of different masters to serve, the Air Force um, and, and the scientific community, but also believers. These are three very distinct subgroups. And he had to sort of carve out an overlapping area in the Venn diagram between the three of them. And I kind of liken that to the program now. And you, you mentioned the UFO <laughs> purists. And I, you know, obviously, I, 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 I understand Kevin's concerns. And I'm going to talk with him next week. But a, a fictionalized portrayal like this show will move the needle far more than any kind of documentary will on the social acceptability and, and ability to talk about this phenomena. And I, I think the show is trying to draw that same kind of line like my father did in real life between being somewhat accurate and being somewhat effective in advancing the state of the discussion. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, now, uh, another question from Dave. He wants to know, what do you think um, your father would think of the UFO research field as it exists today? That's kind of a loaded question. Well, I, I think he'd be happy to see that there is is something going on. He'd be happy to learn that the uh, government spent twenty million dollars investigating uh, what Air Force pilots were seeing, you know, uh, what UFOs they were seeing. Uh, he'd be happy about that, and I, I think he'd be very happy about the uh, interest level at the moment, as Paul pointed out, moving the needle, um, because that usually corresponds to funding or, you know, people, serious people, um, trying to figure out what it is and maybe eventually get a really serious scientific, um, effort going on here. You know, my, my father was, his main message to us kids was keep an open mind. That's nice. Because he was always talking about how, uh, in science they would get very comfortable, think that they knew everything. And then some new discovery would come along that, that would shake their world. And so he was always pointing out examples of that to us and, you know, keep an open mind because there's so much still that the scientific community, physics, does, doesn't know. There's, you know, like a dark matter, this, all this, this stuff out there that's undetectable, you know, so there's a lot yet to be figured out. Yeah, I think that, that's a good point about keeping an open mind when confronted with sort of the early indicators of a potential new phenomena, but then also keeping your mind open to not just flail at the best answer you have available to close it down once you, once you do decide there is a phenomenon. So you've got to keep your mind open all the time. That's right. That's right. And uh, speaking of moving the needle, um, uh, back on December 16th of 2017, the New York Times article um, mm -hmm. kind of moved the needle. Um, what did sure. you, what, did, what was your opinion, uh, either one of you, what was your opinion when you uh, read that? Um, happy, very happy to to read it. Um, Paul, would you go with that one? Yeah, you know, uh, and there's another recent article in the New York Times about my father and the show. Yes. Um, yeah, it which just is came out. A testament to yeah. what the show's doing. You know, um, when you when you have a, a sterling publication like that give a sober, serious look at the phenomena, it, it changes people's minds because if you're not interested in UFOs, you can live a pretty healthy, happy life without being confronted or, or seeing. But w when the New York Times delves into it twice in several years, then people who might not otherwise you know, give it the time of day really have to stop and think, okay, what's going on here? And when they see it reflected through the prism of a, of a relatable mainstream astronomer who was thrust into this milieu and came out the other end, you know, tapping his shoes together, I think people are, are sort of brought along on that intellectual voyage. Yes, and um, just for the person that doesn't know, the New York Times revealed, uh, you mentioned it earlier, that, uh, again, there may be a lot of people just listening to this that are not familiar with, with that, and uh, that came out um, basically saying that Pentagon had um, a research program, and I'm sure they still do, uh, looking at the topic and uh, um, trying to explore um, if it's a threat, if um, you know unidentified, uh, yeah. unidentified objects are a threat. And uh, th that's something that I've always thought was interesting, that the Air Force could never really um, protect us. And uh, we have a call coming in, so I'm going to take that now. 
Uh, caller, you're on the line. Your first name, where are you calling from? My first name is Lee, and I'm calling from Queens, New York. Ah, uh, Lee Spiegel. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's me. That's, that's me. Ah, hey, Lee, I got your uh, email this morning. Paul and Joel, remember that I saw them running through their house many times in 1975 and 1978 when I was there visiting their father, who was working with me on a couple of UFO projects, because I remember you guys very well. Uh, I, I remember you, Lee, and, I, and thank you for the email you sent Nobody this morning. <laughs> no, no, yes. you, you didn't hear him. Go ahead again. No, no. Oh, yes, I absolutely remember you, no, Lee, I'm and I'm happy you. to have received your email. I'm not hearing either of them. Oh, you want me to tell them again? No, no, no. Uh, no, it's my phone system. I, I was wondering if that might happen, so I'm going to... Um, that's one part, I guess, wasn't tested out too well, if you can't hear them. Um, so, Lee, um, if you have the number that I previously gave um, you, go ahead and call back on that. Uh, I'm going to use the old Skype number. It was it was worth a shot. We'll get that ironed out by next show. And uh, the, gonna, the number, you, you're, Okay, do you want me to call back on the number that begins with six? That's right, yeah. Okay, uh, I'm hanging up. Goodbye. All right, so Lee's going to call back. and uh, um, So that's it. I got to put another number up there and that will be on uh, youtube it'll show up in youtube here in a second and, and, and marty so to your point about the a tip the advanced aerial threat identification program you know that's a fascinating discovery or, or revelation or disclosure that the air force had for at least five years that program going on and i think it's very telling that they had the word threat in the title of that project i do too that's yeah that's really how the Air Force looked at these things. You know, uh, Joel and I had the honor of meeting Lieutenant Colonel Robert Friend um, at Joel's house a few months ago, um, one of the last surviving directors of Project Blue Book. Right. Oh, and yeah. he wow. was an amazing, he not only was involved with Blue Book, but was a Tuskegee Airman and worked on the space shuttle. I mean, he's a true American hero. And he was about the best pick of the draw that my father could get. Ruppelt was good as well. But Friend really had to draw that same kind of line that Joel mentioned that my dad did between Air Force responsibility and science. And he was asked a question about what, how would you deal with these things. And he said the first thing he did was to look to see if a sighting or a report was legitimate. And then the next step was, did it pose a threat to national security? So even with somebody like that, a very likable, honest man, a scientist like my father is going to veer as soon as step two in an investigation, because he's going to want to understand the science and replicate and prove and, and get to the bottom of it, not thinking about national security risks. But the Air Force views these things as a threat, either a real threat to our, our civilization or a public relations perception problem. Right, right. I've always thought it was curious when there's, you know, like the O'Hare uh, air, you know, at O'Hare Airport, that incident, you know, that's a threat. You know, that's a threat to aviation, the busiest, you know, one of the busiest airports in the entire country. Lee's back on the line. Hi, Lee. I'm here. I'm back. And if Paul and Joel can just say hi, so I can remember their voices from all those years ago. <laughs> yeah, Lee. I remember you quite very well. It's good to hear your hi, voice. Lee. He looked like Serpico well, back it, then, right? <laughs> a yeah, little bit. I, I, I did. Yeah. I did. And and you know what you know what I have to say speaking of people looking at other people uh I can see your I can see your hand up there Paul. Um nobody has mentioned and I don't know why but but Joel when your head turns in a certain way you look more like your father than the actor who's portraying your father. <laughs> I just wanted to throw that out. <laughs> you know I got to well, say um my my father was uh, kind of noted in what he did, and 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 when people say that to me, I don't know about you, Joel, but I I never like hearing that. <laughs> you look just like your father. <laughs> oh no, doesn't bother you? I like that. Yeah, okay. I mean, I I am sure. No, I don't. I sure. You notice the beard I'm growing here, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I I it, if it doesn't bother you, then I'm on board with that because you definitely do. Okay. <laughs> I also so we have competition. Oh, oh. One of the reasons I grew this mustache. <laughs> uh, Lee, you well, have well, any I other uh, tell, questions uh, for them uh, or comments? Well, actually, I, I wanted to tell just a, a, a good little story about, about your dad that I enjoyed telling to people. Um, in 1978, when Alan Hynek 
was working with me to bring United Nations UFO information, to bring it all to the UN, finally. And we, um, we were both brought over to Hollywood, along with Dr. Jacques Vallée, astronomer, to have a meeting with Steven Spielberg, because Spielberg wanted to know if there was anything that he or the studio, Columbia Studios, could do to help with our upcoming UN presentation. This was just a few months after a little movie called Close Encounters of the Third Kind had come out. And so on the day that, that we arrived uh, at, in Hollywood, I met, I met your father uh, at the hotel where we were all staying, and I helped him upstairs to his room with his luggage. And we, we walked in, he threw his luggage around, and the first thing he did was he opened up this interesting little case. He put it on the dresser. He cleared off a whole lot of room on the dresser. And he opened up this case, and the first thing he pulled out of it was a really nice-looking cassette player. <laughs> Back then, this was 1978, this is pre-DVDs. He had this cassette player, he put it on the counter, and then the next thing he pulled out of the case were two lovely little stereo speakers, put them on both sides of the cassette player. And then finally, he pulled out of the case this lovely big collection of classical music CDs, not CDs, what am I saying? Cassette <laughs> CDs. And he put one in and he said, this is what I like to listen to when I'm working, when I want to relax. And I had classical music there in the room. And, and then when he was, like, done for his stay at that hotel, he'd pack it all away, and off to the airport he went. Do you guys remember that he had this collection and, and player that he carried around with him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, a, <laughs> he was a, quite the audiophile, always striving to get the, most, the best sound he could um, going in his office. And you, you would always hear classical music pouring out of his um, upstairs office in the house. <laughs> yeah, and he said that if he didn't hear music at least once a day, he would get a headache. Huh? <laughs> oh, wow. How about that? <laughs> that? That's great. And, you know, you guys, you both mentioned the, all the filing cabinets that he had, and he had to move things around from the office to the house. I, I will tell you another story. But when I was there in Evanston, uh, <laughs> and I was at his office at um, at the university, and we were sitting around, we were going through previously declassified UFO documents that I'd been gathering so we could put a nice packet together to present it later on that year, 1978, to the United Nations, to the media that showed up, and to all the nations. So I'm sitting there with your father, and I'm saying, Alan, we've got some great stuff here. But, you know, I've got to think that in all the years that you were with the Air Force, with Project Blue Book, and you had access to different places, I have to think that you, you used your fingers into some filing cabinets and pulled out some information to keep in your eventual files. I'm looking for something that I would think would be a smoking gun about this whole thing. Do you have something like that that we can show at the United Nations? And he walked over to one of his filing cabinets, opened it up, pulled out a manila envelope, and as he handed it to me, he said, Lee, I don't know if you're going to think this is a smoking gun, but if you like this... Uh, I'll give you permission, you can use it, you can make some copies of it, and we can give it away at the United Nations. And I had no idea what he was about to give me, and I opened it up very slowly, and, and I started reading this thing, and I can't possibly right now use the expletives that I said <laughs> when I said to him things like, Alan, are you blank kidding me? What the, <laughs> are you kidding me? Where did you get this? How did you get this? And he said, look, uh, that doesn't matter but you can use it at the United Nations. And what, what I was reading was a chapter from an actual science textbook that was given away to all Air Force Academy cadets in Colorado Springs. The name of the science book was Introductory Space Science Physics. Chapter 33 was simply titled Unidentified Flying Objects. And this was a lengthy chapter that basically began with what are unidentified flying objects or UFOs. And it goes on and on and on, telling their cadets, eyes only to the cadets, that UFOs have been pretty much interacting with humans for almost 50,000 years. Oh. And, and that basically, basically we still don't really know 
where they come from, why they're here, what their motives are, what their agenda is. But, but they went down the list of all the possible things that UFOs could be, and the final item on the list was alien visitors. And then they go on to tell the cadets that we're left with the unpleasant possibility that we're being visited by three or four different groups of aliens at their own different stages of development. Like, wow, are you kidding me? Yes. This is my smoking gun. And, and I made about a gazillion copies. Really, gazillion. That's a big number <laughs> because I wanted everybody to see this. Remember, this was 1978. This was just before a thing called the Internet. So this was nothing that would even appear on the Internet at that point in time. And so uh, we prepared this whole packet. This chapter was in our packet. And I was amazed that nobody in media picked up on this. I, I thought, are you kidding me? Th have you people read this? This is what the, the Air Force was telling their cadets in 1968. And shortly after that, they removed most of the information from that chapter in that book. But really, and also keeping in mind, that was a year before they closed Project Blue Book. You know, there are no coincidences in all of this, but this was something that your father, he really wanted people to know as much of the truth as possible. And, and, and I'm thankful to knowing him because he made me realize that this is not a simple thing of UFOs, maybe being uh, from other planets or the Pleiades or something. This is much more complex than I think most nations of the world know about. I think part of the secrecy that your father taught me is that we can't let the public know everything because we don't know everything. It's, we're really in that kind of weird position. So better to try and put it under the rug, try and make it go away, keep it quiet, let the public go about their daily business, their, their nine to five jobs, raising their families and their kids and their dogs. Let's not cause any kind of alert. And, and I always felt that from him. Um, one of the greatest men I've ever met. And I'm so thankful that you guys uh, are here and telling his story and, and offering up his legacy to all of us. Oh, thank you, Lee. That's wonderful. And I'm happy to show you <coughs> I am at a secure, undisclosed location today, and I am taking delivery of some of my father's files that someone is giving to me today in a manila wow. folder. <laughs> Where did these in come from? In a manila from? folder. <coughs> <coughs> these files... These are, are, can you ex tell a little more about those? I don't know because I've not opened the folder yet. I just got here. <laughs> well, we got plenty of time. Let's, uh, let's open it up. <laughs> oh, interesting. Wow. That's wow. Great. Paul, that, that's great. That's great, Paul. Wow. Uh, Lee. Um, anyway, yes. An anything else? I always love uh, Lee. God, really? <laughs> Lee. Lee does wonderful. Yeah. He's such a, a great, uh, when he calls in, he's great. He, uh, um, he's a good friend, and I always love having him on the show. Yeah, and thanks for the well, story. I, I, cool. Oh, well, Great you know, I've, 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 I've actually, uh, Paul, well, I, I, earlier today I emailed you. Uh, yeah. I hope you shared uh, with Joe. I, I emailed you some pictures of your dad uh, and of the yes, two of us at the United Nations in 1978. And uh, to, just to show you that from, from a letter that he sent me in early 78, where he said that he, he, he really liked my proposal of what I'd like to do at the UN, and he's always wanted to be at the United Nations and talk about the UN. And then I sent you another picture that actually shows him there giving, giving his speech, uh, finally, at the United Nations. I would love to see those photos, Lee. Thank you. Okay, well, they're in your, they're in your computer. Please share them with your brother, and I'd love to stay in touch with the both of you. Thank you. Fantastic. Appreciate Likewise. It. Thank you. All right, Lee. Take care. Okay, Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. All right. Take care. Thanks for the call. Um, sorry okay. about the uh, the Skype noise right then. Uh, it's all set now. If someone wants to call in, that number's up on the screen. It's 603-967-4030. Um, so um, one of the things I was thinking about, um, or actually, this is a question from uh, Dave Marlow, but I also was wondering the same thing. Do you think your father ever had any regrets um, being involved in the UFO subject? I would say absolutely not. He, I thought, 
loved the exposure to something unexplainable, to something that might be, um, you know, and a whole other chapter in, in, in physics. He, he liked it. I mean, it was, um, you know, stressful, but I, I think he was very happy to have been involved with it. Uh-huh. I yeah, I would, I, I would echo that, that he didn't regret answering the call to what seemed like a part-time job in the late 40s, uh, which turned into a, you know, an avocation. Certainly had a lot of frustrations with how things happened, and you mentioned the Robertson panel and the Condon committee, but the decision to get involved in the first place, uh, not at all. Very good. Yeah. Now, as yeah. far as him being portrayed on uh, the, the History Channel series, um, I'm wondering how accurate it might be in the way that the Air Force was kind of like um, their attitude was don't get too serious about this. Don't look at it too seriously. We just want to, um, you know, we want to call it something and calm people down. Is it, Would you say that was pretty accurate of what was going on? Yeah, uh, I would. Um, and that was that was one of his major frustrations is that they wouldn't take the subject seriously. They just wanted to calm the public. You know, I, I think initially it was coming from the idea that if the public got too interested in UFOs and too excited about it, they would jam up the communications uh, systems at the time, which weren't that sophisticated, and, and leave an opening for the, the Russians or the Chinese to invade. That was one of their major concerns for squashing the uh, UFO phenomenon. Wow. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the show does show uh, portray how the Air Force looked at it. They just wanted to explain cases. They wanted to solve the cases. And even with that, as, as you can see in, in the graphics in the show, there were over 12,000 cases that Blue Book investigated, and they couldn't explain 700. So even with the military saying, your job is to explain all of them, they did a pretty crappy job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, did, was there ever a case that um, he may have uh, discussed with you that he said you can't talk about? Well, we can't talk about it. <laughs> well, feel free to now. No, no. I mean, did he say, you know, you can't talk about this until I find out more about it? Or did he ever discuss what you could and could not talk about? I well, there was that remember. box in the basement that says, uh, you know, locked box that says, do not open until 2020. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, no, it was just just the identity of various people that we weren't allowed to um, pass on. But the but the phenomenon, the report itself was okay. Sure, I never found one that he he, he said we couldn't uh, express. And what about um, the the cases that were there some that he just thought, wow, you know? Besides, we talked about the Socorro incident, and that had to do with um, Lonnie Zamora uh, being a very credible police officer. You know, that's uh, I know so much has to do about the witness itself or witnesses. Um, yeah. Were there other cases that were just really incredible and uh, um, that he just thought there's really, really something to this one out of those 700? Well, he was um, pretty intrigued with, uh, I guess, the Pascagoula case. Oh, yeah. Uh, with Charlie Hickson and Calvin Parker. Because mm -hmm. um, they seemed, you know, they totally believed what, or he felt they totally believed what had happened to them. Uh, and uh, Charlie Hickson came to our house, and you know it was one of the first times I'd actually seen someone from the South and had such a, a strong Southern accent. Uh, drawl, drawl, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, made quite an Im impression on me. But man, he was so sincere; you, you just couldn't help, you couldn't think for a second that the guy was uh, faking it. Right, and I feel that way about Calvin yeah, Parker, like who's just. Much started talking about it and wrote a book. Um, yeah. You know, he was the other one there. The best part about that case, I was just talking about this the other day, is that they had a hidden tape recorder in uh, at the police station yeah. and that they just revealed, you know, that they were really scared and, you know, it felt very authentic. Um, yeah, he liked that case very much. And he also liked the Father Gill case yeah. uh, that I mentioned before because yeah, so of the credibility of the witness and the the multiplicity of the wit of the uh, corroborating witnesses as well. 
Again, for the person that's uh, new to this, uh, looking into the topic, um, can you explain the Father Gill case? I mean, he came and talked about it. Do you remember? I mean, I, sure, I do know the sure. case. But... So Father Gill was an Anglican priest and missionary in Papua New Guinea. And I believe the case was 1951. It was in the 50s at some point. Um, and so Father Gill hears a commotion outside and goes outside, and he sees a lot of the... Um, the New Guineans looking up in the sky, and they see a craft. And one of the things that struck my father from Father Gill's relating of the tale was how he was able to use trigonometry and, and, and sort of estimate how far and how large the distance or how, how large the object. And they're looking at this craft hovering, and then a kind of um, hatch opens up, and they see humanoids, and Father Gill waves, and they wave back. Yeah. And... You know, just a fascinating anecdote. And then at some point, Father Gill went back inside for evening prayers. And he was criticized for that, and to which he replied, well, I gave my oath to do my evening prayers, not to do my evening prayers unless there's a craft floating in the sky. And <laughs> right. there, was, there were sightings elsewhere in the country, maybe 500 witnesses for this sighting, and, and a witness who, and he came to our house, and I saw him, he was clearly a very intelligent man in possession of his senses who's not going on the book circuit, you know, trying to get publicity for having seen the UFO. Um, and he gave a remarkably consistent account of the, of the event over the years. And my father thought was very struck by the, the fact that there were so many witnesses to the case and such what he felt was an unimpeachable witness. Right. Um, yeah, that... To me, and, and there was a flashlight too. The the following day, when it showed up, I believe um, that they blinked the lights back and forth. Uh, we have another caller on the line. Uh, caller, your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah, this is Steve Bassett calling from California. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. How are you? Welcome to the show. Uh, yeah, appreciate uh, what you're doing, uh, Martin and uh, Joel and and Paul. You're coming forward publicly at this time is extremely uh, appreciated by the advocacy movement. Just two quick things. Uh, one, a quick story. In 1986, uh, I was living in Denver. I'd been following the issue from time to time, but not engaged. And I just happened to, to see some little blurb that there was a lecture uh, being given by the Denver MUFON and that uh, Dr. Alan Hynek was going to present. And so I said, oh, that's interesting. And so I went and I took a date. Uh, this is like the ultimate geek date, I think. Um, and uh, I don't know if she was impressed or not, but I, I went <laughs> and I heard him speak. <laughs> now, later I would learn that this was very close to his passing. And I remember very well that while the, the presentation was wonderful and, and I was very interested, there was something not quite right. But he did not speak to that. Later I would learn, of course, what happened. This was nine years before I entered the field, but when I did start to look into entering the field in, in 95, that, that one evening I was there, and I thought about it a great deal, and it, it, it was part of the reasons that I, that I moved into this field, because I, at that point, understood what he had done, the sacrifices he had made, and the contribution he'd made. Um, so I just want to mention that, and the, 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 the last thing is just a quick question of the two brothers. Um, could you comment on Dr. Hynek's very complex relationship with, of course, the legendary Dr. William McDonald. Hmm. Good one. Uh, James McDonald? Yes. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm thinking of another name. Yes, Dr. James McDonald, of course. You tried, you tried to trick us there, Steve. I know you. <laughs> uh, it's just my, my memory's going. I'm, I'm getting very old. <laughs> yeah, Joel, you want to take that? Sure. Well, I, I remember one time driving up to our cabin in uh, northern Ontario with my father, uh, both, you know, I was sitting in the front seat, uh, driving from Chicago, and he was... He was, I guess he was agitated, you know, by something. And, and I, I said, Dad, what's, what's going on? And he said, well, this James McDonald keeps after me to, um, you know, come clean, as he puts it, on, on what's going on with UFOs. And um, as I mentioned earlier in, in the show that um, my dad was in a, a tough spot because the, the, the serious UFO people you know, wanted him to really, since he, to take advantage of his um, visibility and his platform and say UFOs, you know, are happening, then they represent something we have to look at. And 
you know, why, Alan, are you, you know, holding back? And, you know, because he explained to me that, you know, he had to keep the door open with the Air Force and he had to keep this, you know, his credentials going with the scientific community. And so that caused him uh, a lot of frustration and, and uh, he had a lot of respect for James McDonald, yep. but, um, you know, wished that he could have, uh, I guess, made James happy, but couldn't. You know, he was a proverbial, yeah. you know, a wolf in a hen house. You know, he had access to the data. And like Joel said, he did have great respect for James McDonald. Um, and, but he felt that, okay, I can't disseminate the information as much as I'd like to right now, but I can help with the collection and analysis of the data. So that's still going to help advance the science. And then perhaps someday, and luckily he was able to then disclose cases subsequently. Thank you. Um as I mentioned to Paul, uh, I hope that maybe somewhere down the line in the third or fourth season of Project Blue Book that, that this relationship could be featured in the program. And, and lastly, uh, I commend to the listeners the book by Ann Druffel called Firestorm. Uh, Dr. Heineck is in there, and it, it gets into this, this relationship in depth. Uh, it's a fantastic book, hopefully one day to be, be a movie. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit back and listen. All Thanks. right. Hey, Steve, thanks for the call. I have to say that the, um, both the, the network executive um, in charge of the program at History, Arturo Interian, and the creator of the show, David O'Leary, are huge UFO buffs. And they have, they have read almost all the main books, and they're very aware of James McDonald, and we've talked about him in the show. I'm glad to hear that. I hope to meet him someday. All right, guys. All right. Thank Bye, Steve. You. Thank you, Steve. Bye. Take care. Uh, so, were there other now? Druffle, thats a name um, that's synonymous with the uh, great research, the UFO topic. Were there? Um, and I know sh they were in California, and you were in the Midwest. Um, were there people that your father relied on um, that were, he he thought were especially good as far as U ufologists, you know, ufologists, researchers? Sure. Um, he had what, uh, or there was, what he called the Invisible College, <laughs> which was a, you know, a, a group of, of scientists who were equally interested in the UFO phenomenon, but were afraid to let anybody know that they were. And so there's quite a lot of people who, um, you know, were working with him and helping where they could. Um, and, and then uh, also a set of people, you know, a scientists who would also go out and investigate for him. Um, one was named Powers, um, who was at our house a lot and did a lot of investigating uh, for my dad. Yeah, and, you know, and we, we mentioned Kevin Randall, and we heard from Lee Spiegel, yep. uh, Paula Harris, uh, yep. of course, Mark Rodiger of the Center for UFO Studies, yes. and my dad's longtime friend and colleague, Jacques Vallée. So there was a lot of people that he relied on heavily for help and, and guidance. Right, right. So going back to when, we'll say, the modern UFO, uh, they say modern UFOs started in 1947, yeah. you know, with the Arnold sighting and all that. Um, and they said there's hysteria. I just I had a question I saw it come up on Facebook, and that was— uh, Someone was saying, what do you think the hoaxes were like back then? Do you, did your father talk about actual hoaxes? You know, like a, today, of course, there's CGI. There's, you know, on YouTube, and it's hard to tell what's, you know, real and what's not real. Um, but were there hoaxes back then? Oh, yeah, there were. And it was always very frustrating when an interesting case would come along, and then we would learn that ah, it's a hoax. Very frustrating and disheartening. Uh, there's that famous picture of, um, I think my dad is actually holding it up uh, in one press conference or lecture of uh, a thing that looks like a flying saucer that turned out to be a chicken incubator <laughs> that uh, somebody <laughs> oh, yeah. hung up in the air. Yeah, um, sure, there were hoaxes, yeah. And did he ever, um, he was around when Billy Meyer started showing things. Uh, are you familiar with that name? Yes. Yes, and uh, uh, I forget the particular details of his his particular alien subspecies contacts, but yes, 
Billy Meyer from Switzerland and a lot of goofy photos. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Did he ever talk about those? Did, are you aware of them? No. I mean, Billy Meyer was the, sort of the same ilk, let's say, as like an Eric Von Donneken, uh -huh. um, who were just fabricating things out of whole cloth. Yeah. Yeah. And did he talk about the contact T movement at all? He was reticent to talk too much about abductions and abductees for a couple of reasons. It's very sensationalistic. And if you're a scientist trying to you know, present a credible um, image about a very intractable phenomena, abductions are kind of murky water. Plus, there was also a lot less science to investigate with that. You know, my father made the point that he didn't investigate UFOs. He investigated UFO reports. And so the reports he liked were like Air Force witnesses and, as Joel mentioned, credible witnesses. But when you have somebody who says they've been abducted, there aren't usually a lot of corroborating witnesses or physical evidence to go along with that. So there just wasn't as much to examine and put in a sort of intellectual Petri dish. I see. What about um, crashed UFOs? Did that subject ever come up? Did you ever hear him talk about that? UFO hmm. crashes, the Aztec, well, and there's a number of supposed crashes. I, you know, except from except for Roswell, I can't think of any. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of you know, along those lines. UFO, oh, go ahead. Pardon? Well, no, I, I don't recall. Yeah, certainly a lot of you know reports of uh, UFO landing. You know, landing pad impressions and yeah. broken branches and, you know, a lot of physical effects from them, certainly, but yeah. not crashed UFOs except for... And the, and the second episode of Project Blue Book delves into a supposed crashed UFO in the Flatwoods Monster case. Oh, yes. Which yeah. turns out to have been, in my father's view, you know, a meteor, meteorite, sorry, and, and, an, and an owl. Um but those are good cases. If you can have that evidence, there's just not that many. You know, I guess the UFO pilots are, are, are pretty good and don't crash that much. <laughs> now, I know a lot of people are going to hear that that are into the Flatwoods Monster case and are going to say that was no owl. Um, did he? Yeah. Yeah. Do you hear any of that? You know, there's. No, books I know, I know there. And, yeah. and the episode they show in the Chiron that. The living witnesses don't believe in the owl and meteorite uh, explanation. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting case, and it made for great theater in the show, but I don't really know much beyond that. Well, you can say meteor, you know. It's, it's when it's in the air, it's a meteor. When it's on the ground, it's a meteorite. So it well, was a... It, 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 yeah, it was a meteor. Or at least yeah, until it became really a meteorite. Thank you. I see the astronomer coming through on you. Okay. Yeah, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Not only it looks like my daddy talks like him. <laughs> <laughs> um, did your father, um, did your father influence both of you, your lives today? And uh, <laughs> I'll look at that. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, your interests, for instance. Oh, absolutely. Um, I, I guess I got from my father uh, his interest in, in science and uh, radio and physics, um, yeah, very strongly. And, of course, interest in astronomy as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, I'm sort of the black sheep of the family. I was a French major. Um, <laughs> but I got from my father and from my mother this sort of unquenchable thirst for knowledge. Mm -hmm. And neither one of our parents were really tried to focus or, or steer us in a certain direction. But they just instilled in us this this majesty and magic that's in the universe, and that you should go out and find your passion and find what's really interesting, um, and and delve into it. But they both always learned, and you know, my mother was a you know Joe mentioned a homemaker at the beginning. She dropped out of college, but she never stopped learning, whether it's languages or cultures or archaeology or books. And so the thing we really got that I see from my parents is this um, this thirst for knowledge, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. I, I would just add that uh, both my mom and father were very um, liberal in terms of what they let us kids do, more so than I think any of my friends. And <laughs> that has sort of uh, left us both with this notion that we can go fearlessly into the unknown and, um, you know, 
just be brave, I guess. Yeah, and they were, they were quite liberal by the time my younger brother Ross and I came along after the older ones. I can tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> and what about yeah. your, you, you mentioned your, your mom is, is uh, uh, different than she's portrayed uh, in, in, the, in the show. What, what well, aspects yes. about her were different than what we're seeing? In, well, uh, she was um, much more um, capable and, um, I guess, uh, not as demure as uh, our TV mom is in, in the show. Uh, it would be more likely, I think, for my father to come home and find my mother, you know, fixing the pipes under the kitchen sink rather than, uh, you know, doing what she's doing in the show. But... Um, as, as I mentioned, I, I do believe uh, her character arc will go there eventually. And do you worry at all um, about this is something that someone sent me earlier today and they just wondered if you either one of you worry at all that you're, um, you know, that the the show that's out now, uh, they're going to take things at face value that really happened. They think, you know, in other words, uh, the way it's played out in the show they're going to think your father really did this or really experienced that and and did not. Yeah, I think it's, it is a bit of a worry, actually, because um, at the um, screening party that my brother Paul set up, um, there were people coming up to me afterwards saying, oh, did your dad really, you know, was he really in that crash? And, you know, they were taking a lot of it quite uh, literally. But fortunately in the show, they often show you then the real case and what really happened, which is very yeah. good. And then they also, you know, Joel and I have done some publicity events in conjunction with the show. And on the website, they have an extra sort of vignettes of interviews with Joel and I and Jacques Vallée and Richard Dolan and others and, and Lieutenant Colonel Friend um, portraying what really happened. And I, I think, yeah. you know, going back to an earlier point, I... I think and people are asking me also, hey, did your mom really brandish a fireplace poker by the door? <laughs> Maybe a couple times when I came home late. But, you know, I think the show is not trying to portray itself as being completely accurate. And I think the, the producers and the network are going to great lengths to, to portray a balanced view at the phenomena through a fictional lens and then through a behind the scenes, you know, real peek. Right. Yes, because they do, they do offer uh, a website to go to afterwards to see what really happened. I think that's very important. And um, I myself, I was talking to this about my friend Alejandro, Alejandro Rojas the other day. Yeah. I really, um, when I'm watching something historical on TV, the first thing I do now that we have the Internet is I jump on the Internet and try to find out more details about the story. And I think, um, I think this is a good thing overall. A lot of people <clears throat> complained when in the UFO field complained about Hangar 1, um, but people started talking about sightings um, that were keeping them to themselves. So I think this is a good thing. Uh, Project Blue Book, the series, is a really good thing out there. Um, it's not meant to be historically accurate, and I think once people get over that fact, it's going to be entertaining with uh, tidbits of truth in it that they can research after. So I'm, I'm a thumbs up on the show so far, and... I've mentioned this too. Um, I love the fact that uh, I can see I'm an appraiser and I know, you know, antiques, what was made when and all that. I, it's my study. So I think they're doing a wonderful job on the set as far as keeping the right vintage as far as items. Did your house look like anything like that in the, in the show? Absolutely. Exactly like the show. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. As far as you know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Well, um, it has been a, a true pleasure, and I want to just uh, read this last thing from, um, from Dave, uh, Dave Marler again. Finally, I would like to thank you for being on the show and sharing recollections of your father and honoring his, honoring his memory, and I feel the same way. Um, thanks so much to both of you. Thank you, Marty. All right. Pleasure. It's been a, it's yeah. been a real pleasure, and um, I, hope, uh, I hope the show continues in a success and your father's legacy lives on um, <laughs> for as long as it can right all right that's right yeah we hope so too thank you all right thanks a lot it's been great bye bye now <laughs>